Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness. 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 Foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Wow, well guys, welcome as we get into this. This is a long time coming. Welcome to the very first episode of the Foolishness Podcast with none other. Here we go, crazy, than me, Brian Sumner with his crazy accent. And man, this idea has been in the works, I guess, for a few years. Not something that I knew about, but just different people encouraging me, saying you need to jump into podcasting, you need to get out there and share some of the crazy things you've lived. And Honestly, I'm inviting you all into this in my realm, which is really God's realm, because it's really been the last month or so that this has been impressed upon my heart. Um, a good friend of my wife's and mine, uh, Carrie, came over the house one day around Christmas. Hey, I've got a gift for you guys. Here is a microphone. And how many guys have been bought a microphone? And no. And she said, I felt called. And yes, I'm saying called that the Lord put this on my heart. You guys should really jump out. And as I'm sitting here today, I'm sitting here, you know, with Isaac and Drew, good friends of mine. And Isaac felt the Lord nudging him. You need to do a podcast. Here is himself and Drew in my house, in the room, you know, helping produce this. And I'm just sitting here saying, Lord, why would you want me to do something like this? And really... It comes down to this. You know, I was raised in Liverpool, England. I've got 15 years of friends and family out there in the world that might never hear the gospel. Becoming a pro skater, you know, starting skating around 13. Now I'm in America and I'm around the world. Even more friends, even more interactions. Then I come to faith at 24 and there's even more going on in my life. And I'm saying that to say... I feel like I've lived about five lives and I'm encountering people every day with their ups and their downs. So my hope, as the Bible says, that all of us are living epistles read by all men, that we're the salt and light of the earth, that by putting this out there, sharing what I'm doing, what the Lord's done in my life and having many guests from many realms, whether it's musicians or, you know, actors or pastors or people who are doing whatever it may be i just want to encourage so many of you it gets dark sometimes you're alone at home you're struggling your marriages are shaky your kids are going bonkers and you're going where can i turn we know it's turning to jesus i mean even the idea that's called foolishness is based on first corinthians 118 that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us you and i if you know the lord it is the power of god So I'm here just to begin, unpack this first episode, and rather than making it this big production and it's all serious, I just thought, where could I go? And I really want to dive into somewhere that I was a few months ago. I was invited to speak at Cal State Fullerton. Um, If you're a skateboarder, many of you guys listening probably are, very famous handrails, favorite spots, but I was invited to speak there at the university in one of the debate rooms. I thought I was going to get tore apart. All kinds of students would come and ask crazy questions. I was ready to go. And they wanted me to speak on what is the meaning of life. And so as I began to speak on this, I began to see things change in the disposition. I began to see people taking notes and some people crying and things began to happen. And so even here today, you might be driving in your car, you're sitting at home, you're in bed. I don't know. But I want to begin this where I feel like we should begin challenging the question, what is the meaning of life? And why would this be so important to share with you today? Well, honestly, as crazy as it sounds, this is probably the most important question that anyone could ask, but not too many people are asking it. We thought it as a kid, we ponder it at times, especially when it's dark and depressing and like, does life really matter? But ask yourself the question, when was the last time you actually thought, what is the meaning of life? Especially if you're not a believer. And speaking to those students that day in university, I began to ask them, I know the questions you're asking. You're thinking about what grade will you get? Who will you marry? Will they say yes? How many kids will I have? How much money? And then even the crazy questions too, you know, why is water wet? Is Bigfoot real? Will the Smiths get back together? I mean, I get it. And some of you right now aren't even thinking about that. You're driving along saying, man, this guy sounds crazy. Is he an American trying to be English or an Englishman trying to sound American? And you're thinking I'm speaking with what? An accent, but I'm not. Guys, I am from England. I live in America. This is the way you're meant to sound. This is the Queen's English. A bunch, no, it's definitely not. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. But you're a bunch of Americans trying to speak an English language. This is what you get all over the place. But to consider the question, what is the meaning of life? Think about it, guys. We can only arrive at two answers. Either life has meaning or not. 
either this day, this moment, this podcast, you, your life, your feelings, emotions, your intentions, they all matter or they don't. Who cares who the president is then? Who cares who we're at war with? Who cares who has an affair, if there's abuse, if there's lying and cheating? If nothing really matters, you're just roadkill. The cat that just got hit by a car outside my house, the possum that's going to get squashed tonight, we're no different than that, and nothing matters. Or, in reality, you do matter. It all matters, and I say that because I was born into a generation that had no clue. What did I know about the meaning of life? I mean, growing up in Liverpool, England, a melting pot of philosophy, different religions, so much culture, you know, a bunch of churches, a bunch of different colleges and universities, home of the Beatles. I grew up hearing quotes by philosophers, by religious figures, musicians, rock stars, poets, and celebrities, and none of that really told me the meaning of life. And as I was telling that university these thoughts, I was was reading things about the meaning of life. Alan Alder said, the meaning of life is life. And I get it. Pretty deep. The meaning of life is life. Jonathan Huey said, the meaning of life is to do whatever we choose. So Hitler, what are you going to do? That's the meaning of life. Charlie Manson, what are you going to do? Okay, then you're good to go. Terry Gulliman says, the meaning of life is not an unquestionable answer. It is an answerable question. Terry, I see what you did there. The Dalai Lama said, what is the meaning of life? To be happy and useful. Aristotle said, what is the essence of life? To serve others and to do good. Julie Benz, when asked, it said, the meaning of life. I think the meaning of life is simply to love. Joseph Campbell, on the other hand, has said, life has no meaning. And Oscar Wilde has famously wrote, life is far too important to be taken seriously. So guys, Where do you go with this? If I'm in college, if I'm in school, if I'm going through literal hell on earth, what do I begin to think? Albert Einstein, I'm closing with this thought of this part. He says, the man who regards his own life and that of his fellow creatures as meaningless is not merely unfortunate, but almost disqualified for life. So take a step back. You can see that people are all over the place. We don't know. Does mankind really have a clue? So where do we get our foundation? And to start, I would tell you guys, I don't really have a foundation. I wasn't raised with faith. I didn't have a a worldview. I wasn't born a Christian. I didn't go to church. I didn't understand purpose. Like many other people, when hearing about Jesus, I didn't know, was he a good person with good principles like don't steal and love one another and so on? Or was he God, like apparently he claimed? Or was he a liar? Well, how can you call Jesus a liar? Well, he claimed to be God. So when people say he's a good person, if he's not actually God, he won't be good. Instead, he'll be what? A liar. I didn't care about this as a kid. Growing up in Liverpool, I just wanted to skateboard and play with my G.I. Joes. And I just threw Jesus and Mary in the church in the same part and said, whatever it may be. And see, for me, when standing with these students in this university, many of them had gone there to debate. Many of them had their books out, were taking notes. I was challenging them with these thoughts, and I began to unpack my story. You see, raised in Liverpool, England, home of the Beatles, playing football growing up. Life was all about me and what I was doing. But it wasn't until around the age of 13 that my life began to change. I watched that movie, Police Academy 4, that many of you remember. Um, I was getting into a lot of fights, a lot of trouble. Life was hectic. It was crazy. I was trying to find my identity. What is the meaning of life? Is it about soccer? Is it getting into fights? All my friends are starting to have sex at an early age. They're starting to do acid. They're starting to get drunk. They're in trouble with the police. I was done with so much of what was happening. And so skateboarding came along. And at the age of 15, I was invited to live in California, finished art school, made my way over there. Tony Hawk had said, come and ride for my company. And that for me changed my whole life. My meaning became skateboarding six or seven hours a day, skateboarding, now an amateur, making a couple of hundred dollars a month, then a couple of thousand dollars a month. By the age of 18, 19, a professional in all the magazines and all the videos going all over the world, living the American dream, but what? Having no clue about God. And we know what the Bible says if you're a believer. It says, what does it benefit man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? If I would have dropped dead right then, did I know the meaning of life? And the answer is no. I'm traveling the world. There's more and more money coming in as a professional. You make somewhere between $100,000 and $300,000 a year. It was crazy. And it wasn't until the age of 19 that I really figured out 
this is the meaning of life. When one day I went into a restaurant called Mother's, I met a girl called Tracy, I fell madly in love. First it was skateboarding, now it was this girl. And what did we do? We drove out to Vegas in just a few months. We got married, we got pregnant, and I was well on my way. Some of you here in this might be saying, well, if I can just finish school, if I can marry this person, once I have a couple of kids, I'm going to find this kind of satisfaction. And for me, that was what I thought. I'll live in America. It'll be sunny all the time. I'm going to make a bunch of money and travel the world. I'm going to be content. And those things are really good. But now that I was married, now that I had a son, within a year or two of being together, what began to happen? We began to fight. We saw we had no truth. We didn't really know the meaning of life. We definitely didn't know the Bible. And so before long, like so many today, they say even 50% of those in the church, we were divorced. Brian the skateboarder on top of everything was now angry, frustrated and divorced. I remember looking up to God and saying, God, I'm gonna prove that you're not real. If I can prove that you're not real, then nothing matters. If there's no God, then I am just roadkill. If there's no God, I did just evolve. Who cares anyway? Turn the podcast off. Who cares who passed away this week? Who cares currently sick? Who cares who is the president? But in that season of me trying to challenge God, I began to open up his word. I looked at all the different religions, all the different faiths, whether you say Rastafari, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, I mean, Islam. But it was when I opened the Bible, the Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Remember now, I'm sharing this with a whole bunch of university students that I told them. A skateboarder called Brian, who was now divorced from this woman after we'd fought like crazy. We'd ended up going through living hell, punching holes in the wall, swearing, just being vulgar, having a crazy life, done with it all. Looking up at God saying, I'm done with this. I'd finally opened the Bible for the first time in my life. And in Genesis, right there, God says, let us make man in our image. You might be driving in your car right now and you don't believe that. You don't know that. Many of the university students didn't know they were made in God's image. If you can hear in the background here in my home, the cats and the dogs are running around and I love those guys. They're awesome but they're not a Mago Day. They're not made in the image of God. They're not like you. They're not like me. They're not like my friends who are sitting here with us. And so what took place is I began to challenge God. Well, if I'm made in your image, God, why does my life suck? Why am I divorced from this woman? Why am I getting more depressed? Why am I getting in more trouble with the police? You know what, God, I'm done with this life. I don't even want to live anymore. And as I began to read through the Bible and remember, I'm saying this to you guys to help you open your eyes and understand God's word. How can we put the Bible down if you've never picked it up? And reading that text, I began to get into Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Why does my life suck and what does God say? Well, I put Adam and Eve in the garden. I told them, don't eat of this tree because in the day you eat of it, guys, you will surely die. God didn't say he would kill them. He said they would die. So as they went into that garden, as they ate of that tree, over there, not listening to God's sermon, but instead to the serpents, they died spiritually and eventually physically. Well, God, if you're good, why did you allow this to happen? These were the real questions that I had. And as I began to pursue God's word and try and disprove it, I didn't want to live. I was done with life. This was my last hope. Reading through the Bible, God's appearing to Abraham, appearing to Moses. We see him speaking to King David. And what was he doing? I was going to God to fix my life, but God was coming to me to show me who he was. Show me in Exodus, the 10 commandments. And some of you guys hate hearing about this. It was the first time I'd really heard them. And what does God say? Don't lie. Don't blaspheme God. Be respectful to your parents. I was realizing I was a sinner. And guys, back then, I was easily 20 pounds lighter. I was what's known as a vegan. You guys know what that is? My wife's a vegan. Can you just stop and pray for her right now? But imagine being a vegan, reading the Old Testament, and every year God says, well, because you guys have been bad, Israel, Why don't you go into the temple or the tabernacle or wherever we may need to go and the high priest is going to enter in and sacrifice. He's going to take the innocent lamb. He's going to lay his hands on the goat and put the scapegoat outside of the city. In fact, when the angel of death, the death angel comes down, if you put blood over the doorpost of your homes, it will be a Passover and death won't fall upon you. I was reading all of this as an unbeliever trying to find the meaning of life dead in sin, 
angry at my ex-wife, angry at myself, having no clue while living in the place that I dreamed of living while accomplishing my dreams, the American dream, but still being lost and dead in sin. If someone was telling me the meaning of life, I would have wanted to know, but I didn't have eyes to see yet. I'm reading this Old Testament book thinking this is just some crazy history from the nation of Israel and finally I get to the New Testament. Guys, if you don't know this, the Old Testament is as God spoke to the nation of Israel. Abraham came out of a pagan background and God led the people for thousands of years until the New Testament, 400 years between Malachi and the New Testament. All these prophecies in the Old Testament speaking of who? A coming Savior, a coming Messiah. Finally, I get to the New Testament, and what do the words say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking of Jesus, meaning everything that was written was speaking of Jesus' coming. When his cousin John the Baptist saw him walking the shores of the banks of the Jordan, he said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I didn't know what this meant. I didn't know what this meant pertaining to the meaning of life. What it meant was Israel was sacrificing a lamb every year. It was all a foreshadow of this coming savior, Jesus. Where did Jesus die? Outside the city, like the scapegoat, a foreshadow of the Christ dying on the skull on Golgotha. And what did Jesus do? John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. I didn't know this. I didn't know that the world became fleshed and lived 2,000 years ago. But here's the crazier, bigger picture. I didn't believe this yet. I was reading all about it and some of you listening could know about God, could understand your grandparents' faith or your parents' faith, but do you know him? Because I didn't. I'd bought a home. I was now separated from this woman. I was very angry. She wasn't living in that place yet. We didn't want to be together. It was a love-hate relationship. And I was trying to get God to do all these things for me, but you know what I'd never done? I'd never really laid down my life. God hadn't opened up my heart and showed me that without him, I was dead in sin. He hadn't showed me that the meaning of life was to know Christ. And remember now, guys, just a few months ago, I was sharing this at a big university waiting to be debated. I was reading through the New Testament and realizing that what was separating me from God was my sin. And every person listening to this, we have all sinned. Well, you might say, hold on there, Brian. I'm a good person. The Bible says none of us are good. If we've lied once, what are we doing? We're lying. If we've blasphemed once, we're a blasphemer. There's so many other sins in our day that we and ourselves justify them that proves to ourselves that we're fallen and we're actually not good. And so God was beginning to reveal these truths to me. I was no longer going to God just to fix my life and there was still money coming in. I was torn in the world. I was living the dream. But this came to a place where I remember coming home one day after having community service, getting in a big fight with my ex-wife and the community service was in a Christian thrift store of all places, coming home to the house where I live and I got down in my knees in one of the other rooms in the house and I'd heard a pastor preach on Galatians 5, how there's the flesh and there's the spirit. I'd been living my whole life in the flesh, living for me, sinfully for me. It was the first time God was really addressing with me my sin, my struggle. And in the house that I'm sitting in today, in my daughter's room, that was an office. And my ex-wife at the time, I'd invited her to stay with me. She was staying with me for a few weeks. We were trying to figure this out. I said, let's just try and stay together and make this work so I can at least be there for my son. And in the back of my mind, sadly, I thought, if by the age of five, I'm still over this, I can take my life and at least by then he'll have known his dad tried. That was the sad reality of where I was. That's how crazy it was, not knowing the meaning of life. But in that room on the other side of our home, getting down on my knees, God was opening my eyes. He was showing me that he sent his son to die for the sins of the whale, that Jesus lived, died, and rose again, took all of our sin upon himself, died on the cross, went down into the grave, and rose again, overcoming death, proving that he is the way, the truth, and the life. My faith had never been put in Jesus. I was living for me, but that day God was opening my eyes, drawing me unto himself. And in that other room, I said, God, I'm laying down my life, whatever that meant at the time. I'm giving you my skating. I'm getting baptized. Lord, if you want me to, I'll remarry this woman. This is someone that I was fighting with. This is someone I didn't want to be with. This was someone at times of the day we could be close and feel loving. And in the night we'd be fighting, it would be crazy. And as real as my voice is right here, 
as crazy as it is that we're alive, the craziest thing I could possibly say to you, a very real experience. You talk about scientific, it was as scientific as it could be for me. In that room, seeing my sin, knowing I needed to repent, God drawing me to himself. I said, God, I'm laying it all down. Forgive me. He was bringing me to myself, knowing that he was all, he was the meaning of life. And as I sat there that day, in one instant, it was like the presence of God entered that room, got a hold of me, changed me in an instant, and I was never the same. It was 12 o'clock at night when I probably started praying, and it was easily 30, 40 minutes sitting there crying out, my life's crazy, I'm done with this woman, I'm done with me. Why is it so frustrating? I wanted life to be perfect. Well, because I'm living in a cursed world. I'm living in a world where things are falling apart. Guys, no one dies of old age. There's no such thing. We die because our bodies fail us. We die because the very world we live in, the second we are born, that curse has taken hold of us. After Adam and Eve fell, that curse has been going on through all of time. You and I are going to pass away. And when we stand before God, we're gonna be guilty of our sin without the forgiveness of Jesus. I didn't know that. And in that moment, having understanding the presence of the Lord, Yes, that's the truth. Showed up in that room, got a hold of me. I knew I was wretched. I knew I was filthy. I knew only his blood could forgive me. That's what he'd spoken, truth, before eternity. And in that moment, I had an encounter with the living God. I was laughing. I was crying. I couldn't believe it was real. Telling you this today, it's so real, that moment. And as I sat there contemplating, I went and laid down in the room just opposite me lay down in the bed where my ex-wife is sleeping. My son's now three or four next to me. And as I sit there, she sits up like a zombie and begins to give a speech about almost everything I just prayed. And I thought, this is crazy, Lord. Do you want me to marry this person? Waking up the next day and she being an Italian and Mexican, having this Catholic sort of background, just, babe, I'm gonna live for Jesus. I'm gonna do whatever I'm gonna do. And she responded with, you're crazy. You're not even a Catholic, you're not even baptized, you don't even own a Bible, do you really know what you're doing? And as I began to pray for her, say, I'm gonna live for God, within three weeks time, she came to faith. Within just a few months, we were remarried. We went on to have two more children. In fact, my son is texting me right now from my phone. He's 18 years of age, almost 19 this next year. Our, our daughter Eden is 11 and our son Jude is eight. And I say that to let you know my story. So many of you have heard it, but God is so good and God is so faithful. And that is what I was sharing with those in the university. And here's the amazing thing. Even after saying all of that, it doesn't prove to them that God is real. It doesn't prove to them that there's a living God who loves us, lived, died, and rose again. So where did I go? I told them, it's great, God has saved me. God has restored my marriage, but what is the meaning of life? Well, he starts, as I just said earlier, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The Bible tells you and me that we've been made in the image of God, and the book of Colossians in 1.16 tells us, all things were made by him and for him and through him. That means everything that was created was made for God. My skateboard would now be used to glorify God. It means the same way a guitar is made to play notes. You and I are made in his image. And in fact, if we wanted to take a Bible verse in the Old Testament to summarize the meaning of life, in Exodus 8.1, God sends Moses up to Pharaoh to let Israel go. And he says, let my people go that they may worship me. Those kids I was speaking to, those young adults are thinking, wait a minute, Brian, God is telling us we need to worship him. That's how we were created to worship him. Well, I told them, guys, we're all created to worship God, but you know what we're doing? We're worshiping ourselves. We're worshiping everything else. We're worshiping that which is created rather than the what? Creator. What is sitting on the table right here? An iPhone, an iPhone, it's all about me. Remember that website years ago, some of you never heard of it? MySpace, it's all about you. YouTube and Facebook, it's all about us. We are living in a world, we are worshiping our bodies, fame, success, status, world peace. We can worship anything. I mean, think about it for a moment. Skateboarding is literally playing around on a piece of wood and I was able to buy this house I live in because of my skate career. Think about things like MMA and jujitsu, and I'm a friend, friends with a lot of these UFC fighters. I think about how big it is getting, someone who's been friends with Dana White for years. There's millions and millions of dollars in it, but what is it really? 
It's two men fighting. Surfing is someone riding a wave. As Alistair Begg has joked, the football is simply a bunch of oxygen wrapped in a piece of leather. All these things that we worship and we build stadiums around and we give our money to and we're entertained by. We say, I would never worship anything, but that is not the case. Where your time goes, where your effort goes, where your sacrifice goes, that is what we are worshiping for, worshiping unto. And when you think about it, here's what's amazing, thinking about this a few weeks ago. Hundreds of years ago, talking about the natives that lived in America, talking about even those who came and settled in America, men made their way across the plains, killing this and killing that for what purpose to survive? Well, today I can order almost any kind of food I want to my home. I can buy anything I want to drink. I have access to almost anything and they suicide, depression, anxiety is on the rise. At one time, man was so eager to protect his family and live and struggle to survive. And now that we have access to all of this, all this depression, all this anxiety, all this stress is taking root. I was at that university reminding all these kids and I stopped and asked them, guys, at 20, at 25, whether you're wealthy or not, whether you're with that girl or not, whatever you may think is the truth, do you really have peace? Do you have peace in this world not because your car is clean, not because you have the home you want, not because you have the situation? Do you have peace when it is falling apart because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our peace? Do you have peace when there's cancer? Do you have peace when a loved one has passed away? Because as I've traveled America for the past decade or so, I have encountered people from every generation without peace. Speaking at a huge event in Detroit some years ago, a massive skate event, a massive church, and right after, a girl in the youth group came over and said, Brian, would you mind praying for me? Would you mind praying for me? Well, why? And she said, could you write something on my arm? And as she put her arm out from her wrist to her elbow, what do you think was there? Cuts. Literally hundreds of cuts, cuts that must have been five years old to potentially five days old. Why was she showing me this? Did she need attention? Was she so numb to it? What do you tell her? If you have the meaning of life, what do you tell that girl who's probably five or six years older than my own daughter? The same night, a kid who was an all-star, his dad had just passed away just a few days earlier. It was the first time he was out of the house coming to this big Christian event. What do you tell him the meaning of life is? A few days later in San Jose at a, a youth group and probably 30, 40 kids, a young girl comes over. I need prayer. A few months ago, I got in a fight in my mo- with my mom and my own mother pulled a knife out and stabbed me in my side. What do you tell that girl? What do you point to? Is it something that's online that's going to satisfy her? Is it something that you're going to give to her? Living with her dad, she said her own dad had put her head into a window. I am not making this stuff up. What do I tell each of them? What do I sit with them? What did I tell those university students is the meaning of life? Well, do you know where I went? I went to a verse in the Bible. A verse in the book of Ephesians, Paul writing to those in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. And here's what Paul says to you and I. To Booktooth Brian with his braces and his bowl head haircut who didn't know Jesus, God's word says, we are God's workmanship. Every person in that room in the university, every person hearing this, every person that night that was struggling, were God's workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus for what, O oh Lord? For good works. And here's the good part, guys. God prepared these beforehand that we should walk in them. That means we're made in his image. Genesis 1, and 27, Imago Dei. Everything's made by him. Colossians 1, 16. We're his workmanship. And some of you, as unbelievers in that room that night, you say, well, I don't believe that. Of course you don't. Why would you believe that? First of all, why would you believe something that's written in a book by man? I'm telling this to these university students, yet the amazing thing is they are believing so many things written in a book by man. The missing link or the purpose of life of so many other things, the songs we listen to, the things we interact with, we're so distracted by so many things that are written in books. The difference with God's word is what? First point I want to say, is the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all of Scripture is God-breathed and is inspired. That means that God could have put a jumbotron in the sky. He could have sent us all individual notes, but God, being all-knowing and powerful, whose thoughts and ways are not like ours, He chose to speak through man, through man. He appeared to mankind 
all of God's scripture. That means the Bible is God-breathed and inspired. The problems you might have with it, the struggles you might have with it, challenge it. Challenge the supposed controversies or the inaccuracies. See what the word says. All scripture is inspired, meaning when I send an email, when I send a text, when I write something in a pen, you and I, we are God's email, we are God's pens, we are God's letters, we are recording God's word. That's how the Bible was recorded through thousands of years. And the second part, though, which really goes back to the thought of even this podcast, why it's named Foolishness, is because when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says the message of the cross all that I've just told you about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the message of this cross, it is foolishness to those who are perishing. All those kids in that room, even the adults and the teachers, this is a crazy message if you don't know God, but he goes on and says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, what's often missed in these discussions when you go into universities or you debate people or you talk about people is they want evidence that's not actually there. Yes, the Bible says the universe, the universe declares his majesty. When you go outside and look around and see, to a believer, we say, God made all of this. But to an unbeliever, they simply say, this is amazing, this is vast, this is beautiful. Here's the reality for me. If I was to put my wallet on the table, which I did that night in the university, and I said, guys, there's 40 bucks in this wallet. How many of you guys believe me? No matter whether there is or there isn't, they have to have faith. The only way they can know is walking up there right then, opening the wallet and seeing how much is in there. What is the evidence for God? The evidence for God, the Bible says, is the gospel. It is the good news. I know people try and prove God in so many ways, but you can never see the evidence of God unless he opens your eyes. And what that means is, Come up here, you guys, open up the wallet. Is there $40 in there, yes or no? Likewise, God has said, okay, you wanna know if I'm real? What have I told you in the Bible? What have I told you about your condition? Were you made in my image? Have you told a lie? Are you gonna die because of that sin? When you die, you're gonna stand before me and be guilty? Are you guilty without someone to stand in your way? Yes. Who was stood in our place? The Lamb of God, the scapegoat. What's his name? I've been talking about him all night. Jesus Christ. So if you want to know God is real, if you're the leading atheist in the world from Richard Dawkins to Sam Harris to whoever it may be, you have to open that wallet. Look at God's truth. Ask yourself the question, have I sinned? Do I need forgiveness? Is God a loving God? And as I told those students that night, they realized you have to go open that wallet yourself. I had to come to God myself on God's terms, or we're talking about some of the God. The Bible says in Romans 1.16 that the gospel is the power under salvation. And what that means is that we are spiritually dead without God. We're spiritually dead without Jesus. Who are you, pastor, to tell me that? Who are you, God, to tell me that? Well, that's the whole point. Many people are wearing these shirts. Only God can judge me. And guys, it is not a good thing to fall into the hands of a wrathful God as someone who's dead in sin. It is not a good thing. So as I'm telling all these kids, I'm telling these young adults, I'm saying that because I'm 39. Some of them are really perking up in their seats. They're really beginning to take notes. Some of them I know are Google searching and questioning the Bible and thinking about their various faiths. And they're thinking, well, who are you to tell me I'm spiritually dead? And guys, here's something that I didn't realize until I was in God's word, a very powerful verse that we don't hear quoted enough in John 3, 18. Not 316 but 318 John 318 says whoever believes in him meaning Jesus is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God that means you are born into this world listen I know the end times and the Illuminati and all the stuff we talk about I sold my soul to Satan I get all these crazy ideas guys we're already born in sin we don't need to sell our souls to Satan Jesus referred to the religious leaders as the sons of the devil because you are either born dead in sin or you become forgiven in Jesus, spiritually alive, your eyes are open, your ears are open. Anyone who knows me from years ago says, man, this dude sounds crazy. I do. Or Jesus showed up and saved me at 24. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but if not, the world is already condemned. So if we were to drop dead without Jesus, 
If we would have dropped dead without forgiveness, without that shedding of blood because of our sin, we're guilty when we stand before God, we have no forgiveness. This is further emphasized in a very famous verse in John 3. And guys, I hope you note, as we go further along with foolishness, why am I gonna use so much Bible? Because people are more and more afraid of the Bible today. Even preachers don't want to dig into the word. They want some nice little thought in the middle of a 40-minute sermon that's very funny and comedic. But I didn't hear the truth till I was 24. So to me, I want to live by the word of God, Matthew 4, 4. And in John 3, the story of Jesus, the gospel, which is the good news, it's his story. Amen. We hear about a man called Nicodemus who was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. And he came to Jesus by night and it says, get your Bibles, open up in your app, read it for yourself, John 3 and 1. It says, a man called Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, Jesus had turned the water into wine. There was various things he was doing and these religious leaders were realizing there's a power on him. But by which power is he doing it? And we don't know if Nicodemus came to him by night so as to not be seen or because he was free. Scholars openly debate about this. This isn't a relevant point, but the relevant point is what Jesus told him. This man is telling Jesus both that you're a rabbi and you're a teacher. And Jesus in verse three of John three says, truly, truly, which is to say Nicodemus, I say to you, unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you were born, you cannot understand who I am. You will not get it. Unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus, being a wise man, asked relevant questions. He said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's baptism, and the spirit, that's God's spirit forgiving you and saving you, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You see, every person listening to this, we've been born of the flesh. Our mother, our father, they were physical. The mother was impregnated with the seed. The child was was." The child was formed, she gave birth to you or I, and here we are, born of the flesh. What that means is that from Adam, the first man who fell all the way through time up until now, every man that has ever been born, every seed that has ever been continued on is fallen in a fallen state, just like Adam. That's why Jesus says all of us then are born of the flesh. This is our carnal, our sinful nature. We don't want to live for God. We want to be first. We want to enjoy everything for ourselves. We want to be the most important, the most significant. We couldn't really care less of God. But he says that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Meaning at 24, when I saw my sin and was guilty, God was working in my heart, speaking truth, even the way he is tonight or this morning, wherever you may be, and his spirit might be getting a hold of you, beginning to speak truth. You're either Adam's seed or you're born again and forgiven in Jesus, and now you're of the seed of God. Only one man was ever born without a father that was earthly, who? Jesus, to stop the curse. And he says in verse seven, don't marvel to you that I said you must be born again, for the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit, meaning that when you hear his truth, When you hear of the cross, when you hear of this foolishness, God begins to move in your heart the same way you go outside and you feel the breeze and you say it's windy. God is the one who works in your heart. In fact, even later in Matthew 16, 13, Jesus asked his own disciples, who do people say that I am? And they replied and said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he stopped them and said, who do you say I am? Who are you, Isaac? Who do you say I am, Drew? Who do you say I am, Brian, or whoever's listening? And they said, Simon Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but who? My father who is in heaven. 
This means that I can't win you to Christ. I can't save you. I can't open up your hearts. Speaking to all these students to tell you the meaning of life, the meaning of life was to present the gospel, the good news to them in the hopes that God's spirit would get a hold of them, save them, and they would repent and come to faith. I'd been preaching for 30 or so minutes now and they were still paying attention. A whole Mexican family had come in, various students had come in. Hopefully they'd text their friends and they came in to sit, not just for the free Subway sandwiches, but before me i've been praying lord save them redeem them let them hear my story and here's why because as we're sharing this and the spirit moves john 16 8 says when he comes meaning the spirit of god he convicts the world concerning sin righteousness and judgment because they don't believe in me if you know you need to get right with god it's because of the work of god and here's a crazy reality today Oftentimes, even within the church, we get afraid of even saying the word repent. When I came to California, going to Huntington Beach Pier, all these guys with big signs saying repent, I didn't know what it meant. What am I to repent of? Eating candy, getting in fights, skateboarding? I don't know what the word means. I wasn't Jewish. I didn't understand the Old Testament. But the word repent means turning from your ways and putting your faith in God. Turning from the direction you're going, you say, well, did Jesus even talk about it? Matthew 3, 1, John the Baptist came preaching. What did he preach? Repent. John the Baptist is killed. His head is cut off. Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Repent. In Acts 2, Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, now filled with the Spirit of God, rises up and preaches a whole sermon to many men on that day. And they said, what must we do? Because they were cut to their heart. Remember, guys, I'm saying this to all these university students. I was waiting for a debate. And Peter says to them, repent. Even in Acts 17, 30, the apostle Paul records for us in his words as Luke captures it. In the past, God has overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. What does it mean? It means that you and I who are believers have been sent on a mission into the world. Brian Sumner, the skateboarder, and whatever he's into, through a podcast, through your radio system, through your computer, because God loves us so much, he sent his message out through the earth. What it means is we're called to go in the name of Jesus, preaching the truth, calling people to repent, turn from their ways, let go of their sin, and begin to follow God. Even though they'll struggle, it's beginning that relationship with Jesus who begins his work. You see, I remember reading a quote from a very famous atheist, and he said this to discredit you and I as Christians. He said, if Christians really believe what they say they do, that people were dead in sin, how unloving is it of them not to share the gospel with us. If we really have the truth that heaven and hell are real and we'll spend eternity somewhere as God's word claims and we know to be true, how sad not to tell all that we love that Jesus is Lord and we're all dead in sin and need to be forgiven. John 3, 17 says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world. So as I was telling those students, what is the meaning of life? Telling you today on the first podcast, what am I going to talk about? My skate career, my marriage, my life, be really funny and entertaining. This guy's funny. Look at what he says. I could be saying crude things and talking about stuff, and I'd be really funny to so many people. So many of the most famous podcasters are filthy and say crazy, crazy stuff, and it's very degrading. And you know what? They're making millions of dollars probably. But you begin to talk about Jesus and it messes with people. You begin to lift up the Son of God and it stops people in their tracks because God begins to do a work in their heart. So if someone says to me, what is the meaning of life? We're made in his image. All things made by him, for him, through him. We're his workmanship because John 3.16, for God so loved the well that he gave his only begotten Son. What that means for you is that we need to understand that all of this began in a garden and it was tied to a tree. God said, don't eat of this tree, but a serpent showed up and through their eating of it, man was cursed. All the days of your life, Adam, you'll work hard by the sweat of your brow, by the thorns on the ground. The woman was cursed. You will give birth in child pain. That was never God's intention for it to be painful. It began that way. But can I tell you when it ended? It also ended in a garden. When Jesus sat in that garden, sweating blood for you and I, it ended on 
a tree when Jesus, the Son of God, the only person who was never meant to go to the cross because he's perfect and no sin is found in him, chose to step out of heaven, walk the shores of Galilee, make his way into the city, and die on a tree. And the Bible says, he who hangs on a tree is cursed. He overcame the serpent. He was bare through a woman, and he actually went to the cross wearing a crown of thorns by the sweat of his brow. Do you see God's story for thousands of years lived out through humanity, recorded by scribes, lineages? So let me ask us today, in the middle of some podcast, where are you with the Lord? If that car you were driving in hit a tree today, do you know Jesus? The Bible tells us 100% of all people will stand before God. And I told those people that night at the university, like I've told so many, are you dead in sin? Do you need to be forgiven? Are you lying? Are you lusting? Are you blaspheming God? Are you seeking yourself in your own way? All of us will stand somewhere at the great white throne judgment where you don't want to go, where we are guilty. That's where Brian was headed with his life and his skating all about him and going through his divorce. I couldn't care less about anything. If I'd have taken my life without Jesus, I'd have stood before that great white throne judgment. I'd have been guilty. No one would have paid the price for my sins or as God is faithful. There goes I, but by the grace of God, Jesus Christ showed up, saved me at 24. I'm 39. I've been going around the world sharing this truth for years. Why? Because when we die in Christ, not because of our work, not because we did anything to deserve it, we didn't. Religion is climbing that mountain to get to God, which many religions try to do, but relationship is God coming down the mountain to get to us. That's what Jesus Christ did. You did not choose me, but I chose you. All the Father gives you will come to me. Where will you stand? Before the great white throne judgment or before the seat of Jesus called the Bema seat? Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you confess him with your mouth and believe that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does this mean? This word confess is a Greek word, homo legeo. And what it means is if God is speaking to you, if you hear his voice, if he bends you towards his heart, it is a complete transformed life. His spirit is working on you. You know you have sinned and it's only in the name of Jesus you can be forgiven. Only God can lead you there. If he is leading you there and you begin to see that Jesus is Lord, if that belief happens this moment or this is a seed that's sown and you begin to dig into that word, God begins to speak to you. If you go to your grave knowing that Jesus is Lord and in him alone can you be forgiven because of no work of your own, you will be saved. This is going to be hard for some to hear, but in the office in our room, I prayed a prayer after seven months of trying to disprove God, understanding who he was. That night when we were sitting in the university, I was ready for debate. People were going to ask all kinds of crazy questions, and instead, I said, where are you with the Lord? Have you heard of your sin? Have you heard of your death? Have you heard of eternity? I laid out the gospel clearly that day. Guys, I wanted to pray for them. I said, where are you? What if someone there was been molested? What if someone was temp- tempted with suicide? What if someone was there was just over everything? And we stopped and invited those who wanted to pray to say, God, I believe you're speaking to me. I believe that I'm a sinner. I know I need your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness. I know that Jesus is Lord and God, I want you to begin to lead and direct my life. You see, in the book of Acts, when Peter cried out and said, repent, the Bible tells us of thousands of people that were added to that day. Did they raise their hands? Did they get involved in the church? We don't know. But if you confess him as Lord, he does a work in your heart. If that's what he's doing, leading you to that place, you can be forgiven. It is a work of God. Guys, I simply started this to reach out to people. I hope it's some of my friends from Liverpool. I hope it's people who skate. Some might say, man, this Brian dude is crazy, but I'll tell you, I wish I could have heard a message like this when I was 15. I wish I could have a message like this when I was a kid. I wasn't raised in church in a community that loves the Lord, and I want to do all that I can as God's leading to reach out and to become all things to all men. If you want to hear more from me, go to briansumner.net. But if you're sitting here today in a car and you're saying, man, you get right with God, what we do is this. We open up the Bible to hear about God. We cry out and pray to him the same way we talk to our friends saying, God, I need you. We get plugged into the church because I want Christians around me, people to help me when I struggle in my marriage, when I struggle in my sin, when I struggle with whatever may be. What you're doing today, if you're really hearing this and saying, God, I'm hearing this.
I'm believing you are the meaning of life that you sent your son. You need to take some time and sit with God and say, God, I need to know you. I need forgiveness. I want the hope and the joy that Brian talks about. And it's there that you can confess, cry out, reach out to a loved one, and they will lead you in that truth. Open up his text and you'll begin to walk in a deeper relationship with Jesus, which is why everyone was created to begin with. Guys, we love you. BrianSumner.net. Get in touch. Let me know what's going on. Stay tuned for more. Remember, the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. God bless. This has been brought to you by the One Story Podcast. Yeah.